Obviously, a true story. This is called "Ode to a Senior Drill Instructor." So, so, uh, and, to, and as a response to that, Mr. Wilson, I, I will say that I recited this at uh, Orange Beach, Alabama, at an arts fest uh, a year ago, and uh, a fellow came up to me after I did it. He said, uh, "Would you be willing to uh, go to uh, Arkansas if we paid your way and recite this poem?" <laughs> and and uh, I, he said, we're having a, the, uh, the fifth annual, or, or every five years they do an anniversary of his submarine group. And I said, well, this is obviously not submarines, this is the Army. He said, but it's the same thing. So see what he means by that. Each generation seems to get its own unwanted war, which winnows out the public doubt that life's worth fighting for. Of course, the fates must then decree that some will get the call to lay their lives upon the line, induced to give their all. So in its turn, my own chance came. With high school sheepskin one, I thought I'd found a novel way to flee life's tedium. My buddies had the normal plans, a girl, a job, more school. But I was lured by different dreams, a choice they thought was cool. For I was tempted by war's thrills, and Uncle Sam had need, had told us commies must be killed so Asia could be free. If I had fears, they were dispelled or little understood and saw in war that crucible to end my childhood. My dad had gone the army route in WW2 and he survived, so what the heck, it seemed the thing to do. Recruiters helped me beat the draft, obliged most eagerly, yet eyed me hard for my desire of airborne infantry. Because I was too young to join, I knew I must insist. Reluctantly, my parents signed the waiver to enlist. And so the torch to me was passed, and as my time drew near, renounced all claims to innocence. Back then, life seemed so clear. I said farewell to all my chums. My spirits then ran high, yet on the train I forced back tears from watching mother cry. But soon that bustling army base kept me from feeling blue, for basic combat training served up all that I could chew. I soon acquired some unique skills, like cleaning our latrine, police call, and oh yes, KP, all this by age 18. I shared a room with 30 troops in double bunks stacked neat with 30 more, one floor above, packed tight like sandwich meat. Our cadre, most were seasoned vets, old brown shoe NCOs whose service in Korea's war had left them all gung-ho. No, they weren't there to hold our hands. A different army then. They taunted us unmercifully to forge boys into men. A grizzled Sarge ran my platoon. His morbid wit was keen. He liked to march us till we dropped while well, chanting rhymes obscene. Our captain was a portly sort, his presence seldom seen. Our first shirt marked his 30 years. The XO looked too green. Then we beheld the SDI, a sergeant of first class, with spit and polish, blood and guts, a leader none surpassed, of Irish stock with ruddy cheeks and coast prop crimson mane, had fiery eyes and piercing voice. John Gordy was his name. Cast short in height with stocky build, John never seemed to tire. God help us when he led PT for fear that we'd expire. Was always neat in starched fatigues as through the ranks he sped, well shod in polished airborne boots, campaign hat on his head. And merely by his presence, John personified a spree, for on his chest, that noble badge of combat infantry. Its musket set against the blue, with wreath of silver leaves, a pin that marks an honored group, intrepidly achieved. Unheralded, 
that emblem serve to quietly inspire because soldiers who display that crest have slogged through hostile fire. Despite the years, I still recall, we trainees all agreed, our senior drill instructor was one tough old SOB. Though just one man, somehow he'd know when we had screwed up worst, parade ground or the rifle range, upon the scene he'd burst, he'd glare with eerie lupine eyes from which his temper flashed, his lips stretched taut and snare beneath his handlebar mustache. Then as he read the riot act, he built a head of steam supplied by stalwart lungs that would explode in frenzied scream. A tirade from his lexicon he'd carefully select though idioms he chose were not politically correct. As rage then peaked, his mouth would froth. Abuse flowed out unchecked. You turkeys are starting to tick me off! Or words to that effect. <laughs> so when he paused, we found ourselves were gasping hard for air once John had emptied out his lungs. He'd leave a vacuum there. For when on the receiving end of one of those critiques, well, one never quite got over his rhetorical techniques. Your tongue was tied. Your mind went blank. Your gut felt awful strange. Your knees would knock. Your heart would stop. Your pants you had to change. And even when he wasn't near, we still were on the hook from fear that his imagined gaze watched every step we took. We'd hear him scream, now get in step then. Keep a full canteen, then check your ammo, wear dry socks, and keep your weapon clean. Yep, John went strictly by the book, which served his purpose well, for he knew best what we would find when we went off to hell. Now, some would argue leaders' skills aren't traits with which they're born that Anyone can learn to lead who dons a uniform. But I contend not everyone can be so simply groomed, for some seem ready to command on exiting the womb. Sure, each of us could teach a class of stuff to memorize, but making troops retain it all meant one must improvise. John's tender voice taught us the drills, but lest we might forget his boot upon our backsides posed an ever-present threat. To prove our worth, John sent us on, told us to do our best. To keep from disappointing him would be our toughest test. Meantime, the Army bungled, and instead of infantry, assigned me to a year-long school in high technology. And in our streets, as draft cards burned, peace now, vast crowds would roar. Well, I schemed, chomping at the bit, to be shipped off to war. It took two years to orchestrate, but finally orders came. With only basic combat skills, they put me in the game. And sure enough, stuff hit the fan. The skies were hot with lead. Twas then I thought I heard John snarl, be quick, or you'll be dead. Yes, from the past, that haunting voice gave me that extra push. Hell, I feared more a John back home than Charlie in the bush. <laughs> Once Congress had to sanction war, conscription was its cost. Now presidents pick battles we can't tell we've won or lost. And folks today mouth gratitude to those in uniform, which strikes me odd, for guys from Nam were spat upon and scorned. But drafted or enlisted, one belief we grunts did share, that service to our country was a duty all should bear. It's likely that not all John's boys returned from that crusade. He made the best of what he had, which prompts this accolade. For in my case, John did his job. Yes, he helped me survive, for some small tip he taught back then must be why I'm alive, because though I played no hero's role, I've tasted mortal fear. 
from angry bullets biting air that blazed right past my ear. So, whether it's at Arlington or some less hallowed spot, I'd like to know where John is laid to thank that patriot. And though you say you hate all war, for peace you'll always yearn, you'd better hope there's more like John when next it's your child's turn. I would do a senior drill instructor. Thank you. Very kind.